Hello and welcome to the Creative Future Writers Award 2020. My name is Joelle Taylor and I'm going to be your host for this day's proceedings. Founded in 2013, the Creative Future Writers Award is a developmental program for all underrepresented writers. Winners are selected by a panel of judges from the industry and given support via training, mentoring, coaching, assessment and workshops. Prizes are awarded for both poetry and prose, and prizes include things like cash and developmental opportunities. Now, normally, the Creative Future Writers Award would have a showcase in a big, swanky venue like the South Bank Centre, but lucky you, today, you're going to join me in my back bedroom. And so, we are ready to begin. As you watch this show, please don't feel that you're just trapped at home. We want to hear from you, so do tweet us at creative f underscore ucha that's creative f underscore ucha or you can email us at info at creativefuture.org.uk our first winner is john whitehouse john is a retired academic who's taught writing poetry and media and he has a phd in poetry as a mode of disclosure his work's been featured in magazines including Interpreter's House, Orbis, Frogmore Papers, Snakeskin, Obsessed with Pipework, Other Poetry, and he won the 2019 Hissack Writing Competition for his short story, Unaccustomed As I Am. Here is John Whitehouse. The Long View. A warm autumn evening turns its face to me, sitting on a wooden bench with cold wine. On the horizon, a bluish daub marks the dusk. An old man in a sun hat leans in the street, marooned on hospital sticks, his back to the gathering graveyard haze. Children making footsteps in the hallway remaking the long view in their image. Their faces intervene like cool future moons. Tom Ward lives in London without any pets and he writes poetry and fiction. He's working on his first novel. Listen to him here. We were sat around talking about Marcella McFarlane's broken toe and who might be wing attack tomorrow when there were noises close by. We ducked our heads and scrambled round on our bums. Here's Fulton swaggering over the grass. The next thing he's nearly right below us, side on with his belt undone and his piss drumming the dry leaves. He hadn't looked up, but a feeling came that I recognised right away. The night was taking a wee turn and there was no rewinding it. I looked at my mates. Vicky had moved back on her elbows, chin down, feared. Pauline was lying flat, her face all sparkly with mischief. I made the eyebrows at her. I loved the lassie. I would choose her to burn my diaries if I died. But she was just a wee bit unpredictable with cider in her belly. So quick and low and right into the trees, she shouts, Put your dick away, you clown! She looked so chuffed with herself that Vicky and me couldn't help doing the big-eyed giggles, despite all the bother that was coming. Who's up there? Fulton goes, after a wee minute. Me and Vicky shook our heads at Pauline, mouthing the warnings, doing our panto faces, shitting it. Who's down there? Pauline went, taking another swig. Then he goes, come down and find out. Pauline went back and forth with him, buying a wee bit of time, and it all seemed to be dying down until he said he would climb up and join us. There was no way we were having a low life like him up here, on our roof, under our sky. So because I was newish in town, and because we all thought he wouldn't recognise me, and also because I kind of needed a piss, I volunteered to go down. On the ground, I brushed the moss off of my jeans and said, hello, Fulton. He didn't seem surprised that I knew his name. Stuffing his hands in his pockets, he says, so what do they call you? His face was raw and he was grinning. He had loads of teeth. Cora Mowat, I says. I looked up and saw smoke break apart as it rose from the incinerator chimney. He repeated my name like it was something weird on a foreign menu. 
then told me he had never heard of me. I felt lucky not to have grown up here, to have not been written into the local loyalties. What you lassies doing up there? He went, the emphasis on lassies, the big aggressive grin still going. Drinking, talking, I said, shrugging a lot. I had no right to feel I could handle this. Then, lassies can't climb, he says with a wee bit spite. You could smell the drink on his breath. The dread was turning to weariness, maybe anger. I felt the usual stressy niggle in my head, stinging and real like a bramble scratch. And then from nowhere, I was picturing my alarm clock, its two cheap, rattly metal bells sitting over Lisa Simpson's smugly face. The alarm hand pointing down at 6am. I wondered what time it was now. I they can, I tried. His drunken mates were bleating away on the other side of the trees, a menace to everything. He paused, swaying slightly. Do you like my Timberlands? I looked down. The orange suede was freckled and piss drops, and I wasn't sure if he knew. I, Come here. He started walking away, scuffing the grass with the broad boots, hands flat in his bum pockets, elbows out. From behind, his head was round as a gobstopper. I followed. We walked across the grass to a large concrete slab and sat down. He stared into me awkwardly for maybe five seconds before he cleared his throat and went, So what are you into? I thought, lilt, dresses with pockets, speaking to dogs, eating bread, rain. Just hanging about, I said, and looked down at my deformed trainers. The air was cool and you could smell summer coming. He shuffled his arse closer to me. He went, how come I've no seen you around? You're a wee stunner. To me, it didn't seem true that you could be a wee stunner while dressed in a plum coloured fleece with a blotch of cream emulsion on the sleeve. I just moved here not long ago, I said, the out of town sing song kind of proving it. Careful with what I was letting out, I said with a crap laugh. I'm a bit new. What school? St. Therese. I fancy you, he said. His wee adult brain had judged that this approach would be enough to win the heart of a gargoyle like me. I looked back at the rooftop, but Vicky and Pauline were either hiding or gone. I didn't want to walk home alone. Jenny Elliott is a Bath-based spoken word artist, poet and short story writer. Entering only her fourth year of performing, she's so far performed in and around Bath and Bristol, Shambhala Festival and Unislam 2019, where she won an individual award for her poetry about mental health. The Roundhouse Slam 2019, where she placed fourth and became the first ever audience winner, judged by the audience, and most recently at Bristol's Lyra Poetry Festival, where she competed in the annual slam and won. Gianni's poetry explores everything from social injustice to personal grief, from sex to heartbreak, and she prides herself on her uncomfortable combination of explicit honesty, humour and melancholy. Gianni Elliott. And then you died. And then someone laughed at something funny from outside the toilet cubicle where I was holding my breath captive. And then I had to call my mum and my sister and my friends and tell them that you died. And while I listened to the sound of them crying because you died, I also listened to the sound of conversations between strangers and supermarket checkouts and the car engine slowing to a stop. And then I thought the grief is probably the quietest thing that there is because the world never gives it a chance to speak. And then I still had to get the bus home. And for some reason, I still had to say hello to the bus driver and thank you when I got off at my stop and I even still had to turn my key to get into my front door and the worst thing about it all is that none of it hurt not even a little bit and I was so angry at my skin for holding shape is there no respect in death is there no give in all of this and then the world spoke to me while I was clawing at the small tear trying desperately to escape down my cheek as if it were the last penny I had left after spending a million the world spoke to me and it laughed at me for actually believing that the walls of 
of my throat could get stronger just because I had too much to swallow for actually believing that the earth's plates would make some room for me just because I had too much on mine for actually believing that grief is a quiet thing because suddenly I was enclosed inside the ordinary four walls of my everyday flat and the world left me in there to fend for myself with no open windows and finally that last penny tear did fall and when it hit the ground I haven't ever heard anything louder than the sound of grief finally introducing itself to me in screams and shouts and I didn't think the world could hear me when I begged for it to please just make it all quiet again and then the kettle flicked and then you died and then it was tomorrow and then you died again Our next winner is Tabitha Bast. Tabitha lives with a child and a cat in a cooperative community in inner city Leeds. She works as a psychosexual therapist and her writings range from political articles to fictional short stories. Previous work includes Eclectica Magazine, Plan C and Navara Media Online. And in print, Shift, Dysphoria, and a chapter in book Occupy Everything. She won the first prize with Grist Publisher Anthology Protest, was long listed for the Walter Swan Short Story Prize and an honourable mention with Literary Taxidermy Short Story Competition 2018. Tabitha Bast. You will have heard of the vet of Wuhan. Madame Wei was keeping herself to herself during the outbreak. This was not hard for her. She generally kept herself to herself, and as a sane, small woman in her 80s, the rest of the city obliged her. She had been keeping herself to herself for 20 years, and this was no hardship for her. Madame Wei was not entirely alone, though. There was a chink in the shutters. In the 11th of those 20 years, she had acquired a cat. She did not precisely choose to own a cat. Her indifference to fellow beings was not restricted to humans. She was not the old woman who tucked strange cats under chins or threw dogs' chicken bones. She was neither a cat person nor a dog person. She liked her books. She liked her daily walk. She liked her quiet. And she liked, as we have established, to be let al left alone. But nine years ago, Madame Way's quiet was shattered by an unfortunate outbreak in her block of flats. Not as now, a new and deadly virus, but tr a traditional problem for cities from Wuhan to London. The quiet was contravened by the scratch, scratch in the walls that became the unmistakable brown of rodent droppings upon her clean kitchen surfaces. Madame Way was not happy about this intrusion. She set traps and the mice would take the cheese and leave droppings. She was bothered enough to speak to her neighbour below, a slender young man who should have been married by now, a vet, Lao Mao, he was not her nearest neighbour, but she assessed correctly that he would offer the most expertise. Yes, yes, Lao Mei, Mao squinted when he spoke to her. We've been experiencing an infestation. He was agreeably succinct and sullen. I've heard reports of their resistance to traps. I suggest you get a cat, madam. He bowed almost imperceptibly. She did not approach the idea of a cat with sentimentality. As a woman who had chosen not to have children, she certainly did not want a ditzy kitten whining for attention. She left with a curt, thank you, and went about her business without anyone bothering her and without her bothering anyone, until a week later, when she saw a scurrying brown shape in her bedroom. Enough was enough. Madame Wei asked Lao Mao if he could get her a cat. A worker cat, not a pedigree, but one that could fend for itself and rid her home of mice. And dutifully, a few days later, Madame Wei was unpleasantly surprised by a knocking on her door. She assumed crossly that it was another parcel for next door who were never in. But it was the vet with an ugly, sullen cat and a carrier. Madame Wei, the vet said, I have a vet, I have a cat. I see, said she, peering at the animal through plastic bars. You still need to feed him, Lao Mao continued cautiously. They cannot survive in their hunt, not in a block of flats. He gave a little laugh and, he added, emboldened by his act of gallantry in getting the cat in the first place. And if you go away, I'll be happy to feed him. Thank you, Madame Wei responded politely, though really she thought, where on earth does he think I'm going? The vet told this story to his assistant at work, whom he wondered about dating. She was kind about the story, although he reluctantly acknowledged it was a mediocre story and a mediocre life. 
It was not until late he had a real story and the real courage to ask his assistant for dinner. The cat moved in that evening and within hours he presented the corpse of a tiny mouse. There was no more scratching. The cat moved in and the mice moved out. And over the years the unfathomable happened. Madame Way and the cat developed feelings towards each other. He moved into her bed at night and slept curled up by the bend in her increasingly arthritic knees. And she, for her part, welcomed it. She looked forward to arriving home from her daily walk and him greeting her, found comfort in the weight of him on her lap when she sat and read. It is fair to say, Madame Way loved him. And if you'd like to know more, you'll have to buy the book. Helen Bowell is a poet and arts administrator based in London. She's the co-founder of Dead Women's Poetry Society and a graduate of the Writing Squad. She's been a London Library Emerging Writer, a London Writers Awardee, a member of the Roundhouse Poetry Collective, and was commended in the full Young Poet of the Year Awards. Her work has appeared in Ambit, The Fenland Read, Strix, Arana Poetry, Introduction X, The Poetry Business Book of New Poets, and elsewhere. She works at the Poetry Society. Helen Bow. In the autumn, the barman and I visit Eden. They've put up signs since the last time we were here. Some say, do not walk on the grass. Others inform guests about the mass extinction. A dragonfly bumps into a leaf. A peregrine falcon nose dives. A mother asks us for money. I want to change everything and nothing. The barman takes my hand, suggests a tea break. I buy a fresh scone, the exact shape of the barman's fist. In the gift shop, we touch everything. Hope is printed in big letters on tea towels. I know time is measured in Celsius. At least I have enjoyed the seasons. When we go home, even the sun looks away. Laura Long Howe is currently writing her first novel, which was shortlisted for the Penguin Random House Right Now competition in 2018. When not writing, she can be found running around northwest London, where she grew up and occasionally stopping to take pictures with cats. Laura Long Howe. A jingle, louder and more obnoxious than the doorbell ringing. With it, the smell of gently steamed rice, like a fog, a congealment of starch in the air. Sikvana, a marbellos, as if the chirp of the rice cooker isn't mobilising enough. I'm still clearing my books from the table, when she appears at the dining room door. Sikvana, she repeats, this time with more bite. Time to eat, is what she's saying. Why haven't you set the table, is what she means. Amar has always been impatient. One day, it'll be the end of her, when she discharges herself from the oncology ward, where she's worked for most of her life, only to be dragged back a fortnight later, never to leave. But today, it means she's burned herself on the stove again. Stir-frying bok choy should never be this incendiary, but Amar hasn't got time to blot her vegetables before flinging them into the wok. The rush of water hitting oil drowns out the sounds of her cursing. This is Amar at her most efficient, a whirlwind blowing from stove to sink, sometimes brandishing a spatula, other times a knife. It's more of a meat cleaver, really, but Amar wields it like a surgeon might do a scalpel. Papa calls it wasted potential. Amar always tells her to go and pok guy. Tomorrow, she says, gesturing at the rice and choy. You bring this for lunch, all right? She's asking as though I have a choice. The all right comes out skewed, too, more or I than anything else. I can't tell if it's because Amma still gets her R's and L's mixed up on her tongue, or because there's too much food in her mouth to leave much room for enunciation. I nod, silent. She nods, satisfied. Her chopsticks scrape the bottom of her bowl, rhythmic, musical, like champagne flutes chinking together in quiet celebration.
Sin San catches me throwing out my lunch that week. She's a tall, imposing sort of woman, more a papa than an ama, if we're going by the number of white hairs on her head. She has that uncanny ability that most Sin Sang lack. To command a class of rowdy children with a single sharp look out of the corner of her eyes. What are you up to, eh? She demands, hauling me away from the bins by the scruff of my neck. She's strong, surprisingly so. Papa attributes that to her being a Hakyan, but Ama says that being black is only one part of it. She likes Mrs. Emmanuel. They chat for longer than they're supposed to on parents' evenings, though how they understand each other is a mystery to me. Perhaps they found common ground, swapping swallowed up th sounds between them, or sharing a mutual love for rhetorical questions, most of which end in the translingual syllable ah. It comes as no surprise that Ama finds out that I've been dumping my lunch. She doesn't smack me for it, doesn't even ask me why. It doesn't occur to me that this revelation has hurt her, because Ama is the strongest person I know. Stronger, even, than Mrs. Emmanuel. But she's quiet as she scrapes the rice grains from my thermos and retires it to the back of the kitchen cupboard. Now leftovers go in Tupperware. Tupperware goes into the fridge. Ama always cooks more than enough, because old habits die hard, but also because Ama never stops thinking about tomorrow, or the day after that. White bread appears in the kitchen. Ama has always been impatient. She's got the pots and pans to prove it, their bottoms scalded beyond repair. In Cantonese, we call it wok hei, as though food is supposed to taste of charcoal and of last night's dinner, and of dinner three nights before that. My lunchbox no longer smells of it. It smells just like everyone else's, of yeast and cling film, juice cartons and bruised fruit. No one peers over my shoulder to poke fun at my rice. No one accuses me of eating maggots when it's clear it's just chow mi. As one, we tuck into identical sandwiches, and though my bread's a little stale and my ham's much too salty, I swallow my mouthful and smile. Mrs. Emmanuel looks away. Sick fana. Ama grunts later that, eating, later that evening. <laughs> my stomach growls as she sets a bowl of rice down on the table, followed by a plate of song. The meat pieces are charred, blackened to the point of almost inedible. My mouth waters as I pick up my chopsticks. Ama serves me first, as she always has done. We eat. The Creative Future Writing Award was founded in 2013 by Creative Future. And here is the director, Jane McMorrow, to tell us more about it. Hi, Jane. How are you? Hi, Joelle. I'm well, thank you. It's lovely to see you. Thank you for that introduction. Yes, set up in 2013 and now in our seventh year. Mm -hmm. And um, it was set up um, to offer an opportunity to all underrepresented writers. And that was so that's people who perceive that they have a barrier to opportunity due to mental health or other health issues to uh, identity, disability, social circumstances. So it's very broad in terms of um, who we offer that opportunity to. Mm. And it's not just a prize, but it's a, a long term development opportunity. Um, and we work with prose writers and also with poets. It's very important to mention that yourself as a poet, particularly. Um, and it's open ended and we and we like to think of ourselves as a community of writers. So we stay very much connected with our previous winners and other writers who have um, engaged with us. And we're still working with many of those previous winners, offering them opportunities to deliver our workshops, um, but also really enjoying seeing their successes now that we're sort of um, you know, seven years in, we're seeing some of those previous winners having real success in terms of getting their work published, winning other prizes, getting themselves an agent. Um, mm. And we see us, the, the, the Writers Award really as a kind of little stepping stone, or if you like, a little leg up into the publishing industry, which, you know, quite frankly, um, for any writer is a, is a very, can be a very daunting place. Yeah, so you said that you've been going for seven years. How has the work you've done over that time helped to shake up, wake up the publishing industry? 
Well, we have the most amazing, amazing partners um, within the industry. Um, and I'm not going to mention any particular names because I because there are so many and they're all fantastic. Um, and they've been so uh, and many partners who are very well in, established within that publishing industry and have a lot of influence and their support has been extraordinary in terms of how um, they support us, how they share our opportunities. And it's unquestionably now that the work that we've been doing has just been, and there are a lot of other organisations doing the same thing, but undoubtedly the Creative Future Writers Award has woken the industry up to a little bit to the problem that they have and continue to have with lack of diversity in publishing. Um, and so we're very keen to continue doing our work and continuing to support those writers who are now starting to, to see those opportunities coming through. For them. It's certainly something that's really necessary isn't it, across the whole board. One of the things that really interested me looking at Creative Future Writing World plans is the way you intend to use previous winners now as workshop facilitators and train them up. Can you tell me a little bit more about that plan, that ethic, that you know, central ethic to the awards? Yeah, well, as I was saying, we now are seeing some of our writers, and it does take that time. You know, it's been obviously seven years since the first awards, and it and it takes that time for any writer to start the, to establish themselves and to start seeing that um, success. And 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 you know, one of the great journeys for any writer is that um, is that process from your 2000 words to the completed manuscript mm -hmm. and you know any writer needs support through through that process and that's somewhere that we you know that we offer and we want to do more in terms of offering that so when we are we're thinking we're planning now for next year we're starting to um submit uh, funding applications we're at that point um, and we thought we were just thinking of ways in which we can continue to support some of our, our winners, uh, previous winners. And um, and we so we are some of our winners are going to be delivering our workshop program, but we're also able to offer them some training and mentoring in terms of, of, of those teaching skills they need to have. And mm -hmm. so that's a really nice opportunity, not only to offer that training, but also to offer some paid employment you know well, absolutely and I think it's, it's right. crucial for the industry that writers become self-sustainable yeah. it's how we all develop and one of the as a writer myself one of the most important aspects of that is when you are first published and it's in print now as part of the awards you've created an anthology what can you tell me about the anthology tomorrow it's arriving next week and we're wow. very very excited so it's all um it's all um, being printed as we speak, probably, and they'll be arriving here at the office next week. It's called Tomorrow. Um, uh, that was a theme that we set for this year. We didn't anticipate when we set that theme sort of way back this time last year that that would have be quite so significant as a theme. Um, so we, you, do, you will see some pieces in there that very much um, reflect on our current situation in terms of COVID-19, um, but, but also others that are, are not sort of reflecting on that. So, but it's a, so it's a real mixture and a really fantastic selection from our winners. Um, we have six prose writers um, and six poets. Um, and we also have pieces from our judges, um, Kerry Hudson and also um, Anthony and Naxaguru who um, have pieces in the anthology. Um, so please, everyone, they're, they're on sale now via our where website. Can we, where can we buy a copy? Buy a copy on the, uh, via our, our website. You can just go onto a Creative Future website and you'll see our online shop there for not only tomorrow, but all our anthologies that we've previously printed, as well as other publications. Okay. Um, and also, we're very excited that uh, for 2021, we have a new bursary opportunity. Um, which is again focusing on our previous winners. So it is an application pro process. Um, only our previous winners will be eligible to apply. Uh, we're working in partnership with the literary consultancy and we're able to offer 10 bursaries um, and that will be giving um, mentoring opportunities a manuscript assessment from the literary consultancy as well as training and networking so a fantastic opportunity there for, for 10 emerging writers which we're really really excited about and more news on that very soon.
that does sound absolutely compelling and thank you for all that you do at creative future for those of you who want to get hold of the book and please do because every book you buy supports a writer go to creativefuture.org.uk go to the shop there buy one for yourself buy it for your mom christmas is coming so yeah. Morris, thank you so much for joining us today it's been lovely to speak with you joelle bye bye Ellie Jackson writes poetry and fiction. She is interested in the emotional experience of mental health, gender, class, language and other things. She has an MSc in creative writing from the University of Edinburgh, a BA in English from the University of Cambridge and a few scattered publications. She works for Nourishing Change a collective combating food poverty and instability in Edinburgh. Brain Journal, 9.45, Brain, 10.02, Brain, 10.06, Brain, 10.23. Last time it poured, the old man couldn't get up. I can't seem to get up either, even though I'm not old, or man. 10.26, Brain. 10.27, drums its fingernails against the window and runs away. 10.37, rain. 10.38, sets off a car alarm. 10.45, breaks against the window and a spattering of tiny birthmarks. 11, sun, a break, a crack, a margin. 11.20, rain, a shower. 11.30, our shower's still broken, runs cold after 30 seconds. 12.30, rain, outside it tickles my skin with cold scratches. 12.35, rain, drips through my brain down my throat into my mouth. 12.37, yeah, tipping it down, I confirm as I get on the bus. 12.37, patters down like the peas on the tip of my tongue. 12.43, rain, lashes against the window. 12.48, stream streaks, peels off like split ends. 12.49, I pick up my split ends. 12.55, rain. 12.56, rain, streaks make shapes. Watery hexagon, a map, a constellation, the chemical structure of serotonin. 2.30, I collect the rain in my hair. 3.16, rain. Smells like a scented candle, kitsch alchemical sky drops. 5.32, I stick fish hooks through the sky drops and hang them for my ears. Next winner is Hinali Patel, who is currently travelling the south of England investigating British folklore and magic. She's also a professional tarot reader, a journalist and women's rights campaigner. Her previous work has been published in Rewrite, Reads and Shortlisted for the UK Writers' Retreat Short Story Prize 2019. She's working on a collection of short stories bringing together the mundane and the mystical, told through the strange and wonderful voices of British Asians. Read more of her work or get in touch. www.hinalipatel.com Hinali Patel If you ask me what day I found the hole, I wouldn't be able to tell you. We'd been locked in the house for weeks by then, my mum and me, and I guess dad too, if we're counting the almost dead. I suppose I could have checked my phone for the date, but, you know, it just didn't seem so important at the time. Anyway, I have a bad memory, so I didn't know. Sometimes I can't remember which socks I wore yesterday, so I wear the same ones the next day. That's just a small example. I'm not thorough. My best friend Cindy says that even though we're not allowed to go out or do anything normal, she still waxes and plucks her eyebrows every week. Honestly, I've just let it all grow. I'm not even attending online classes anymore because my computer broke. It just flicked off one day and never came back on. No one bothered to check where I'd gone. So, by the time I discovered the hole, I suppose you could say that I had already slipped under the radar, off the grid, out of the jurisdiction of the education system and I'd probably been wearing the same socks for over a week. I'm not proud of it, but I've been sneaking out in the afternoons. If you were me, you would too. When the house doesn't stink of curry, it smells like a hospital room. 
The doctors just charged Dad because they needed the extra bed. Now, the dining room table is piled with this stuff. Bags of used dialysate, tangles of tubes and clips, some spare artificial kidneys. When you open the kitchen cupboards, boxes of divan, dioxetine and sarafen rain down and batter you. I stack up my Chinese meals for one, next to a huge drum of the poetin in the fridge. Mum moved her idols from their bedroom to the garage to make space for Dad's life-sustaining equipment. She spends most afternoons there, reciting prayers and feeding her god statues saffron milk and rice. So it's easy enough to leave unnoticed. I exit by the front door, but turn into a side street as soon as I can to avoid running into any infected people or police on the main road. The first time I saw one, the hole was the size of a scoop of ice cream. It was in an alleyway not far from the house, wedged between a laundromat and a boarded up greasy spoon. By that point, the government had blockaded our area for about a month or so, and I'd never seen the streets so dead. It was like the whole place had turned into a museum. There were hundreds of leaflets pasted over the road signs and doors, the same bright red words fluttering in the breeze wherever you looked. Have you seen anyone acting suspiciously in your area? Signs of infection include bloodshot eyes, grey pallor and incoherent language. Stay well away and log your sighting on the NHS Diz Ease app immediately. In the alleyway, someone had graffitied Go home, you twat, on the floor. I noticed the hole because it was smack bang in the middle of the second O. Then it really caught my attention because there was a small gold coin inside it. I'm not talking about normal money. This was the shape of a wobbly circle and it had the words Caesar Augustus printed around the side profile of a man with a crooked nose and lots of flowers in his hair. He was clearly not from these parts. The name was familiar from school. I Google searched it on my phone just to be sure. Then I pocketed it. It's not every day you find the head of a Roman emperor from 2000 years ago on the street. I didn't know it then, but that wasn't going to be a one-off discovery. I started sneaking out to check on the hole in the O every day. There was almost always something in there, like it was waiting for me. Not only that, but as time passed, the hole got bigger and the treasure inside it got bigger too. Soon I had built up a collection that was more sizable than my mum's shrine in the garage, although this was a real motley crew. Multiple sandstone figurines of headless women with huge bums and boobs, a turquoise two-headed snake, a clay pot painted with thick red swirls and birds, a bronze cat covered in Egyptian hieroglyphics, a double-headed battle axe, and much more. It would be reasonable to think that this was some kind of setup. The authorities around here have done stranger things. The possibility did cross my mind, but I never discovered any hidden cameras or people nearby. Just those flapping leaflets and a ghostly version of me on my own, reflected in line after line of dark, empty shop windows. As you know, all of the winners are chosen by industry professionals. And now we're going to go to the head judge, Kerry Hudson. Kerry Hudson's Tony Hogan bought me an ice cream float before he stole my ma was the winner of the Scottish First Book Award, whilst also being shortlisted for the Southbank Sky Arts Literature Award, Guardian First Book Award, Green Carnation Prize, Authors Club First Novel Prize, and the Polari First Book Award. Kerry's second novel, Thirst, was published in 2014 and won France's most prestigious award for foreign fiction, the Prix Femina Etranger. It was also shortlisted for the European Premio Strega in Italy and her first non-fiction book, Lowborn, took her back to the towns of her childhood as she investigated her own past and what it meant to be poor in Britain today. Her forthcoming book, how to Cope, a Survival Guide, will be published in 2022. Please welcome Kerry Hudson. Hello, I just want to say 
what an honour it is to uh, read alongside all of you and to wish you enormous congratulations. Uh, the standard was extraordinary uh, and uh, a genuine pleasure to judge and um, I hope you're all celebrating tonight. This is a very short piece of mine called Lip Gloss. I want another mother. When I got in from school, she was in the kitchen, bent over the chopping board. The smell of onions in the air. This house always smells of onions. Her shoulders tensed, but she didn't look around to me. Didn't say a word of welcome or acknowledgement. I pulled at the synthetic band of my skirt, pinching my waist. Felt the tears rising in a big bubble up my chest. I told her what they called me at school. Whore. They all say I'm a whore. She peeled the skin from another onion, sliced through the flesh with practised hands. Whore, she asked, but still didn't look up or around. Who cares? Names can't hurt you. It's one word. Grow up. Each word punctuated by the knife blade hitting the board. I stood staring at her hunched shoulders. I wanted to defend myself, to tell her how I didn't ask for this, that I didn't even know I changed until I felt the hot, insistent drumbeat of men's eyes on my breasts. I still thought I was a girl, but now they saw a woman, a possibility something to be taken. I wanted to tell her that my best friend Nicole stopped eating. At first, just a few things so that she might not change in the same way. And then almost everything, as though she wished she could disappear completely. I wanted to tell my mother that the name does hurt. It hurts like a cut. But I didn't say any of this. I turned and left our flat and strode out under the wide summer sky. Across from our house is a news agent with the glossy tiles of magazines displayed. On those covers are shiny women, tits and arse and perfect teeth and not a single roll of extra skin anywhere. Why weren't they whores? In fact, it feels to me more and more that you must be beautiful, must be sexy. Otherwise, you're no one, no sort of woman. You must never be fat and you can't be frumpy. Don't be frigid. You should be anything but frigid. Except, of course, a whore. And where I want to know I want to ask my mother, is that invisible place between being a whore and being what is expected of me? But perhaps she spent too long squeezed tight by those expectations herself, that she'd heard them so often that they buried down deep and started to feel real. I know I must never admit it to anyone, but I still believe I am beautiful. I know somehow there is power in this. Yes, I'm helpless against my body's changes, but with them I feel something unstable but potent, a new sort of strength. Mum leans out of the door. I see her, both drawn tight and falling apart. Parts of a woman rather than a whole one. Perhaps she's come to me with some softness after all, to tell me something she wishes she'd been told. Isn't she a woman in this world too? When I smile towards her, the smell of strawberry lip gloss drifts up in the heat of the evening. But before I can call out to her, she shouts over to me, walk out of me, will you? Standing there putting on your makeup, they're right enough to call you a slut. So I turn my back to her. 
Now we're heading over to meet another member of the judging panel, Anthony Anaxaguru. Anthony Anaxaguru is a British Cypriot poet, fiction writer, essayist, publisher, and poetry educator. His poetry has been published in Poetry, The Poetry Review, Poetry London, New Statesman, Granter, and elsewhere. His works appeared on BBC Newsnight, BBC Radio 4, ITV, Vice UK, Channel 4, and Sky Arts. His second collection, After the Formalities, was shortlisted for the 29 T.S. Eliot Award and named by both The Telegraph and The Guardian as one of the books of the year. He was awarded the 2019 H100 Award for Writing and Publishing and the 2015 Groucho Maverick Award for his poetry and fiction. In 2019, he was made an honorary fellow of the University of Roehampton. Anthony is the Artistic Director of Outspoken, a monthly poetry and music night resident at the South Bank Centre and a publisher at Outspoken Press. Anthony Anaxaburu. Across from here, where I began for argument's sake, let's call it love. Each day pinned itself to the next. My mother, when using my father's name, would know what to do with us. My father, far away in an unlit capital, already falling further into his glasses. Our kitchen table, minus his rage, a column missing its figure, where I first said aloud, father or dad or sir or nation or God, to a blank seat, a white plate with one mottled prune, the severed leg of our cat. So let's say for argument's sake, I was a good boy looking for my father in songs or movies or the house of my childhood, which burnt down the last week a whole family died. My mother saying it's fine for boys to feel terrible and ruined alone in life, which ends up infecting us all. And God knows why. It's sod's law, we find ourselves whispering father into the side of a pillow, a kid's face at school cracking open his small ears, blood leaking out or not leaking at all over the canteen floor with its unswept crumbs, a rogue gym bag, always a mirror before bed, the shot pheasant by the sink waiting for my mother. The day he returned, the word father left my mouth differently. I started to say things no longer mine, an airborne destined for another life. They still found it within them to look back, to check I was there. Let's just say words have always wanted to disappear, managing to stick around only by the amount they're repeated farther. For argument's sake, let's call it love where I began. <laughs> Now we're going to meet the third member of our judging panel, Sorella Estruk. Sorella is a writer, poet and critic whose poetry, fiction, creative, non-fiction and reviews have appeared in journals and newspapers, including the Poetry Review, Wasafari and The Guardian, and have been featured on BBC Radio 3. Sorella is a former winner of the Poetry School Nine Arches Press Primus competition and a member of the Ledbury Poetry Critics. Her poetry short, The English Dream, appears in Primer's Volume 3, Nine Arches Press. Sorella Estruk. Flight, or on reading Ada Lemon. There is so much living we miss out on because of fear. Like that plane we missed by a millisecond, because we hesitated for a nanosecond before stepping onto the escalator or through the precarious doors of the lift. And when I see us standing here on the runway of our lives, as the jet flies over our head and the clock tick tocks impervious, sometimes it's all I can do to stop this vessel from self-combusting. You want to know the truth? Le Mans poems make me want to take life by the neck and shake it up. Enough to tell us what we need to know, 
how to race the clock and overtake, leave time gasping on the asphalt as the first inch is gained, and then the next, till we're striking out into the corrugated sky, wings angled against the blue, beating time together. Creative Future 2020 Writer in Residence and a fourth member of the judging panel is Akila Richards. Akila Richards is a writer, poet and spoken word artist whose work has been published by Penguin, People Tree Press and Waterloo Press. Some of her writing gives voice to the black German experience and on migrating in multiple ways. Akila's portfolio includes programming and managing creative and diverse community projects, including Africa Beyond and the South Bank, Refugee Week events, and currently the Lit Up monitoring publishing scheme with Waterloo Press. Akila also programmed the Mboka Literary Festival 2019 in Gambia and the UK. She is currently competing her poetry collection and writing a novel culminated from a selection of her short stories based on the same character. Please welcome Akila Richards. For police who murder, dedicated to our recent ancestors. What will you do when the beast mirrors you back? Pleading, force feeding on white mess. What will you do when the slow banal murder chokes you, clinging to concrete stone breast? What will you do when black soul reveals your ill deed, electrifies your dead heart attack. What will you do when freeness in full blood moon on pure indigo takes your breath away? your last one. Chloe Elliott is a British Malaysian Chinese poet based in Durham, where she's currently studying English literature. There, she's president of the Poetry Society, where she helps facilitate workshops and run spoken word events. She is the winner of the 2019 Timothy Corsellis Prize, has worked forthcoming in Bad Betty's 2020 Survival Anthology, and is a member of the writing squad. Chloe Elliott. Eating orange peel is an act against God, the sand tells me, and I laugh. Look here, buddy. This mandarin sits different. Inside this mandarin is a small Chinese girl curled up with toes that aren't yet toes but clusters of milkweed. Let me tell you how to make a mandarin like this. She should only be cut open with a palette knife. So you have to spin her like skinning a snapper. Keep her turning on the balls of your fingers until she grows bigger and bigger and dizzy until she splits. Then you can bleed her but wear marigolds in case she spills. The milk's a cardenolide, pink like a night slip or a darling's foam and toxic if consumed in large quantities. You know, when it dries, it crosses over like amber and makes a seal. Or seven, or eight of them. These words spoken in season. If you pluck them individually and lay them in the palm of your hand, you can see them beating. Small white roots tapping on a Georgian window as the sun sets. They leave trails like drawings on a shower door the way the heat will permit. Where the tiles repeat back the afternoon to a room that is ochre, whose boneyard is everything waiting to be sunken, or read to, or made a malt drink. If you line the girls up, they spoon each other like kidney dishes, and each kidney dish is a kidney that if pieced together will make the bisection of a rose, a stained glass wheel, 
the crown of a saint's head peeping through a loft hatch. In every segment there is a kneeling, a stubborn vesper. As you prepare the knife, the windows begin to rattle, and then her shoulders. They pucker and dress to bed. Seren Thomas is a non-binary writer from South Wales. They currently work in the health and care sector, and in particular, they're advocating to improve eating disorder services, research and recognition for LGBTQIA people. Some of their favourite things include poetry, going to greasy spoons and long walks around London. Hands full of tea and midnight snacks, I turn the kitchen light off with my nose. Wading through the dark, I find you wrapped in rose petal sheets. In sleep, you bloom. The laughter lines that usually prick the outsides of your eyes are smooth and peaceful. I nuzzle that nose of mine into the nape of your neck, releasing the stress that lodges there and breathing in just a little snatch of the strength that lies there too. Lengthening your spine, pushing your shoulders back, your courage. The heat glistens on the road like a riverbed. We take it in turns to carry the rucksack. You go quiet when you're struggling. The pollen is ruthless today. It squeezes tears out of your eyes and every time this happens, whether it's hay fever or chopping an onion, my heart begins to hit. You drink from the bottle with your head craned up towards the heavens. Despite the urgency of your thirst, the water falls into your mouth without a single splash. Watching you reminds me of a child I once knew. I used to write his name wherever I went, etched into pavements, rubbed into mud, stroked into wet sand. Each time I left it behind, I couldn't stop myself from looking back, and when it was almost out of sight, I'd call, see you later. We reach the park and our feet cry out with relief as they sink into soft and cool ground. Sweat drips from my armpits to my elbows. We stop beneath an oak tree, stretch out upon a carpet of crisp packets and empty cans, and watch the fat flies jazzing and dancing above us like clouds. You sing me happy birthday at the top of your lungs and you don't care who hears. You squeal and wrinkle your nose when we kiss because mine is wet and salty like a pup. On the 10th of January he was born and on the 11th of May, some years later, he died. My birthday is 12th of March. Mum once told me that the reason she struggles to celebrate my birthday is that she gets depressed between the day he was born and the day he died. She listened to Macy Gray and wrote poems about listening to Macy Gray and about how much she missed him. I gave up trying to mark it some time ago now, because when I think about it for more than a second or two, the grief com comes back so sharp and real that it might as well be another person standing beside me. So once there was no one left to hold me to account, I started to pretend it was a day like any other. It's midnight and there's a searing pain in my arm. Macy Gray is playing in the background as you gently poke my bicep with a needle. When you're done, a tiny moon shines out of my skin. We go for a walk, and as we step outside the front door, you stop and hold your breath, and I'm scared something is wrong until you whisper. I've never heard it so quiet. We spot the moon. I say spot. How could we miss it? Off to the right over the railway tracks. It's gold and swollen, just starting to wane, but still almost full. We agree we need a better view. We reach the railway bridge. Here the moon droops low and oozing over the skyline and, eat, and I reach out to pluck it like fruit from a branch. We lean against the mesh, sticking our noses through the holes, edging ever closer. I break my gaze to find you rummaging in your pockets. You pull out a lighter and place two tea lights on the railings by the road. Before you've managed to light the second one, I'm sobbing. You hold me as if I would fall without your arms around me. With your free hand, you scratch his name into the railings, right between the two flames, and the clean, newborn metal radiates silver moonbeams. You wipe the tears from the end of my nose and kiss me. You don't care that I've snotted all over your coat. One of my bogies is stuck to your cheek. Shall we go home, you ask? We stumble down the road like wounded soldiers. Your arm is tensed and I feel the strength of you. When we reach the corner, you stop like you know I need to say a proper goodbye. The tea lights wiggle and somersault. They're winking at us, you say. The darkest hour doesn't actually come before dawn. We lie awake, skin on skin, hearts pressed so tightly together that I can't tell which beat belongs to who. 
Earlier I spent 10 minutes sitting on the toilet just staring into space, in complete awe of you and scared stiff that somehow I'll fuck this up. Don't you ever let them go, I told myself. Now your nose is nestled in my ear, and every exhale rattles off the walls of my skull like a warning. The morning brings a different world, one that is usual and hurried and empty of magic. I walked down the same streets as last night, but nothing feels like it should. I peer down the drains and wonder what forces have hidden themselves away beneath the grates. Back on the bridge, the tea lights remain like the trace of a spell. The wicks burnt down to hard black dots, undisturbed. They fizzled out naturally. His name is faint and thin now, but we know it's there. Alex Metaxi is a London-based poet and filmmaker interested in the poetics of queer identity, as well as using the city as a site for both anonymous and intimate experience. Their poetry has previously appeared in the Isis magazine and the Oxford Review of Books. They are the co-editor of Sect Viscera, a queer arts magazine launched in East London in 2019, and they're also the recipient of the Martin Starkey Memorial Prize for Poetry 2018. Alex Matraxia. Male Nudes by George Platt Lyons. Lincoln Kernstein commissioned George Lyons to take photos of the men in the New York City Ballet sometime in the 40s. There's one image in particular, hard to say if resolute or distant, a black and white rendering of two nudes, tight asses, pale, solemn, definitive. One man heaped on the bed, his face and heartbeat muffled by the mattress. The second guy's wrapped around him, as if the first man were falling, like a liquor bottle slipping from the hands of the other. My first thought was, God, you're both so large, arms like branches. So how comes the embrace looks so painful, so harshly absolute in its security? Is the former muted by an unspeakable history? His story unutterable, torso clenched like a fist? The latter insisting with his body, it'll be okay. Knowing what lies outside of the bedroom, the infinite wrath of modest, mild society. Without knowing what later days will bring, how could every touch not pierce the body like an arrow, first of light, then of warning? A swift pleasure looking for the dancing man who doesn't want to be the target to be touched, not knowing if tomorrow brings endlessness or grace. I think the former guy is hope embodied, moving further away from himself. But the second body insists, wordlessly precise, spooning the outline of the fatal song. This photo, their lying pose, what can it say but it'll be okay? before the dancing men cease trying. Michelle Palpon lives and works in Surrey after an early life spent in West Africa, Europe and the US. She's worked in both mental health services and social work, working with women escaping domestic violence as well as academia and undertaken research into black women's experiences of mental health recovery. She currently facilitates creative writing courses for both Surrey and Borders Recovery College and Mary Frances Trust and is lead governor representing service users for SABP. She enjoys laughing at every given opportunity with her large and noisy family. She loves Ray Charles and Stormzy and looks forward to being 60. Michelle Palpong. Olive. I come here twice a week, that's allowed. The social worker said, you can't go every day, but you can go twice a week. So that's what I do. There's not many places like this, you know, where you can sit all day and get some good food. I'm talking about good food. Food from home. Dasheen. A little salt fish. Sometimes a good spicy broth, my grandmother's food. Food that feeds the soul and fills the belly. It costs one pound fifty. Whatever you eat, no take on pots allowed, but whatever your belly can carry. That's when you hear me say there's not many places like this I can tell the truth. Though I try not to lie at all. Tell the truth, shame the devil, my grandmother used to say, and I try to shame that old rogue every day. 
I used to live near here when I first came from home, down the Effer Road, just off the front line. You know the front line, don't you? I came to meet the miserable bastard who had come to the yard the year before and filled up everyone's damn fool head with promises and plans. He told me he had a house and a pretty car that in London everybody had new clothes every week and me and him would have big people's sons, sons who would be doctors. He even sent, said he would send money to my father to work his small piece of land. My daddy's eyes were big, as wide as he would lean in to light the suitor's cigarette, Benson and Hedges. He did look one fine man back then. He had a smart suit, brown with big turnips at the bottom of his trouser legs, matching trilby hat and the pointiest, shiniest shoes you ever saw. My father said, you sure you don't want Shirley? She's a hard worker and light skin. But he wanted me because he said I was soft. She's soft, he said. And I flushed warm and poked my tongue out of the corner of my mouth at Shirley, who tossed her braided hair and sucked her teeth. Well, I was full of soft in those days before I came to this here town. Ephra Road is all changed these days. All the big houses, the ones where we had rooms, all done up fine now. And big people live in them. Big people who don't see me. But I remember when I first came, all those houses had 20 or 30 people living in them. Black people mostly. Lots of single men, but a few women who they had sent for, like me. I was a sent for woman. And we stayed in two rooms in one of those houses. Number 17. I remember that. Because that's how old I was when I moved in. From the day I saw that place and put down me grip, I knew I had married a snake. Even from the dockyard, his face was hard and he didn't talk, only asked me if I'd bought money or pots. How am I going to carry pots, I thought. And though my daddy had given me three dollars, I said, no, no pots, no money and his face was blacker than I remembered. From that first night he lay on top of me, putting his thing in me, never saying any kind words or asking, just doing it again and again. And though it hurt, I was already tired of my softness. Because sometimes I was just a little grateful for him doing it, as he kept me warm in that room when there was no two shilling for the meter or we had run out of paraffin for the fire. Well, that is it, the Creative Future Writers' Award 2020. Thank you to all the poets and prose writers, to all of our partners, the judging panel, the Arts Council who helped support the programme and the Emergence Foundation. Thank you especially to all those writers who submitted, whether you were long-listed or short-listed, please remember the awards are open again in 2021, where we'll be delivering these awards ceremony, hopefully from a much bigger venue. Finally, thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. Take care. Keep writing. <laughs>